Don't go away. Coming up, I've got Doug Lip of G. Douglas Lip and Associates. And, and I tell you, you got to listen to this guy. He's got some great stuff. The, the topic itso- itself sounds boring. And we're going to talk about customer service. This is important stuff, but this guy is dynamic. You know, might want to know a little bit more about him. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit right now. Uh, he has an extensive history with the Walt Disney Corporation, Walt and Roy Disney. They are the guys that created founded this thing. We'll be right back. You're listening to Rick Gillis Employment Radio. 975 The Ticket, brought to you by CumulusJobs.com. Welcome back to Rick Gillis Employment Radio on Houston's ESPN Radio 975 The Ticket. Here's Rick Gillis. Good morning and welcome back. This is my last volume of Employment Radio on 975theticket.com, and I've really got to thank everybody for having made this such a great run. I'm really jazzed about that, and uh, but it is time to move on and do some other things. I'm right now talking to Woody Sixel of the Houston Chronicle. We have her for a few more minutes, and then she's got a bolt following. I've got Doug Lip of G. Douglas Lip and Associates, more importantly, keynote speaker, world-famous quacker. Uh, I did say that. I meant to say that. World-famous quacker. You'll have to be listening to find out more about what I'm talking about there. But this guy is really interesting, and I've got two of his books in front of me that I'll be telling you more about. And if you're at the HR Houston Symposium, Gulf Coast Symposium this week, he is a keynote, and so everybody else is going to get to hear what they don't hear today. Um, I, back to Woody, Woody Sixel. I wanted to ask you, um, let's go kind of broad on this. I like to tell people I do a lot of job search preparation for people. I speak to a lot of groups, and I like to tell people I'm really glad we're in Houston. I'm really glad, quite frankly, we're in Texas because in other places I wouldn't even have a a, a crowd to talk to because if there's nothing to find, there's no reason to tell them how to job search, how to prep job search prep. Or your feeling on the overall economy, or what you what what are you hearing, what are you seeing on the streets? I know you're really plugged into this stuff. I think it's getting actually a little bit better. I than, do too. Than it than it, uh, than it was just a month ago. I'm, I when I talk to um, recruiters, they tell me they're getting job orders, mm-hmm. and and I know people who are who are who have been on the market for a relatively short period of time, who are finding jobs, and and you, we've seen uh, job growth in government. That's one of the um, that's one of the key uh, key growth parts of the Houston economy, and 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 also in. In areas that you might not expect, uh, seen some some uh, growth. I've seen some in healthcare, right? And and um, of course the perennial bars and restaurants. Uh, sure, there there is always turnover there, but um, th- then there's some in the some in the in technology areas. Okay, I mean, just you know, IT kind of uh, uh, in play. There, companies are still hiring strategically. And right, they still need people to do stuff. They've they, got a mission and a goal, and one of it is survival. I, I was really stunned when I went up to one of the uh, job ministry programs up in in um, the northwest part of Houston, Northwest Bible Church. Yes. between job ministries, yes. sure, yes. they're friends of ours, of course. And uh, they had a whole bunch of recruiters lined up to talk mm-hmm. to the people who were there losing their jobs, and mm-hmm. and and I talked to one of the recruiters who said that this is a great, great place to find really expert people. With very specific skills that they need in jo- to fill job orders, and uh, you know, people were standing up there saying that they they have sales jobs um, and uh, they've got openings, and it comes with the company car, it comes with a you know relatively high base salary, and uh, you know, I, I think a, a BlackBerry too or something like that. Uh, that um, you know, come see me at the you know at the end kind of thing, and and uh, th- there was there were jobs available and they had a lot of postings up there and you know one of the things that you're saying that's so important though is that um and you know and i teach a lot about job search prep getting your resume all that stuff but you still got to get to the person who has the job and that is and i don't have a problem ever saying this 60 to 80 percent of all jobs are found as a result of networking telling somebody you're available telling somebody you're seeking a new opportunity and I like to tell people it is semantics. You're not looking for a job. You're looking for an opportunity. You know, don't ever sound needy saying I need a job. I want a job. That's not a good thing. It's just it's semantics. It's the way we perceive things, the way we hear things and, and um, sort it through our mind. Um, any hints, any tricks, any things going on that you ought to that a job seeker ought to know about? You need to tell everybody, you know, that 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 you're looking for for a job. Yeah. And and you yeah. do it in a you know drop it into the conversation, mm-hmm. 
Talk to people at the grocery store. I mean, it, it, everywhere. You just can't miss an opportunity. You don't know who somebody knows. You, you never know. You can't know. know. You never know. Right, exactly. And, and you just have to be conversational about it and pleasant and and um, and just drop it in as um, part of... Uh, part of the of the conversation and uh and also it's really important to nurture your networks before you lose uh before you lose your job so you always have a um uh, always prepared absolutely and because too many people do, that's that is really rich advice that last piece always be nurturing the networks uh you know i hear a lot and this is uh, a little grind a little thing rough to say but the fact is a lot of people are saying now you're only between job searches Absolutely. Ouch. But always be prepared. Always be prepared. Woody Sixel, we're going to let you go now. I know you've got somewhere to be, and the clock says it's about that time, so I'm going to let you get out of here. Um, I want to thank you very much for finally making it to the show. I want to thank you very much for being, I guess this is your first time ever on radio? No, it's actually not. It's not? Okay. But, but we've but but it's been a great experience, <laughs> oh, and I really good. appreciated the opportunity. Good. Well, Thank I've you so got much. some things working here in the in the near future that I'm hoping maybe I can grab you one more time, get you back, and we'll we'll keep developing this uh, relationship. So, Woody Sixel, uh, the Houston Chronicle business employment writer. Thank you very much for being with us today. It's my pleasure. All right, um, Brett. I'm going to start moving on now because I've got to get Doug Lip on the show, and. Um, Doug Lip. Matter of fact, let me just go ahead and straight to his um, bio. This is pretty pretty good stuff, guys. This is pretty important, and I'm glad I got him. I don't know if I'd have got him if he hadn't wasn't coming to Houston this week. But Doug Lip is an internationally acclaimed expert on customer service, leadership, and diversity. Motivates and challenges audiences around the world as a consultant and speaker. Doug has spent over 25 years working from the front lines to the boardrooms of corporations around the world. Formerly the head of training at Disney Studios, Walt Disney University, Doug also worked at Disneyland, where he provided the well-known Traditions Orientation Program other, and other leadership courses. This is really important stuff, people, because Disneyland, as you always know, always is a great place to go in and a great place to leave. And there's there's a reason for that. It's taken a lot of work and a lot of effort. Doug had a lot to do with that. Pivotal in Doug's career with Disney was his experience in the mid-'80s when the corporate culture changed from the arrogant, we're the best, why change, to the progressive. Don't rest on your laurels, powerhouse corporation that remains today. Fluent in Japanese, Doug was on the startup team for Tokyo Disneyland, working in Japan for two years, creating Disney's first international theme park. He's the author of six books, including his most recent book, The Changing Face of Today's Customer, which proclaims the use of cultural sense, which I've always railed upon in this show, in addition to common sense. He is also the author of Even Monkeys Fall from Trees, and i got to tell you, I had to learn about that title. It's about the balance of art and science for outstanding customer service. So, Doug, I understand, and I said earlier in an earlier segment, that you're a pretty good quacker. What's all that? What's that all about? Oh, good morning, everybody. How are you today? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Doug, I okay. You got to tell me. You know, I was talking with your wife when we set this appointment up, and she told me you quack. Now you got to tell me where did this come from? I know this has nothing to do with being fluent in Japanese. Am I right? Oh, I can't quack in Japanese. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> How did you learn quacking? Why quacking? And then tell me about the quack off that was that was held at Disney. Well, the, the quacking is an innate ability. You either have it or you don't. That's I agree first, with that. I agree with that. One. Second one is the man who was the original voice of Donald Duck, a guy named Ducky Nash was retiring, and so we actually had a retirement party for him, a 50th birthday for Donald Duck, and along with that, we had what we called a quack-off at the Disney Studios, and I actually won that. The guy who was the MC of the event was the voice of, Don of uh, Mickey Mouse. Really? And it was kind of surreal to have some 6'3 guy looking like a lumberjack <laughs> talking like Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so you, I mean, how long were you at Disney? I was at Disney for 10 years, including a college internship. Okay, is that where you started? Is that how you got introduced to them? Yep, exactly. Okay, and, and I'll tell you what, let's go back because I've, I've been reading it through your books, and I know, uh, a matter of fact, I asked you, and of course it's in your bio, that you're fluent in Japanese. That was just a passion. That was just a passion. I flunked out of Spanish, so I figured I'd take Japanese. It was easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the symbols, right? They're yeah, they're a lot. They're a lot like uh, yeah. Okay, right. you, that's tough. And then you went. You know what? But one of the stories you told in there that is so good, and it's the reason. Uh, let's see. I'm looking back for my. Here we go. Um, changing face of today's customer. Your book, right. Cultural Sense. Right. Big deal. You lived it. Yeah. You went over there. You immersed yourself in it, and you recognized what you were missing. And I think that's a big story. And I think. 
We have had several guests on the show talk about cultures. You want to go ahead and go to that, and then we'll we'll tie that over to customer service. Well, certainly. I mean, that's that's a huge topic unto itself. But I realized that being fluent in two languages did not mean you were fluent in two cultures. Or, and in, in, you were missing life. Exactly. Yeah. And we at Disney, one of the things that we did, and a lot of companies do, they made the mistake of spending thousands of dollars on language training for executives, only enabling them to go into the foreign environment and upset people in their native language. <laughs> so that's not a very good way to go about doing business, quite frankly. No, it's not. Yeah, well, I'm here, and, and you know what? And I've also said this many times on this show, and I think it's somewhere we want to go a little bit later in this dialogue, but um, we as Americans are arrogant, we're impatient, and we expect instant gratification. Do right. you think I'm right? I do, and I, I also think, quite frankly, a lot of other cultures around the world are very ethnocentric as well as we. Of course. So it's, it's whatever, sure. whoever is the dominant force will think that they're right. Will in Rome do as the Romans? Precisely. Yep. Okay, you know what? Let's go ahead and talk about, and I'll tell you what, I've got to go over to uh, Even Monkeys Fall from Trees. That's pretty <laughs> okay. interesting because you said, isn't that, didn't you say that was a, a, an ancient Japanese saying? Yeah, I learned that proverb when I was a student in Japan, absolutely. That rarely do will you ever see a monkey fall, but if he falls, it's because something's out of balance? Yeah, I learned from a man who was in his 80s who was a very well-known potter, and he was showing me a lot of pottery that was he had made, but a lot of it was broken. And I asked him in my halting Japanese of the day, wow. when did you make these things? It must have been months or years ago when you were an apprentice. He said, no, I made that one just last month or that one last week. And I had this quizzical look on my face, and he knew that he needed to teach Grasshopper the meaning of life. And he went on to say that no matter how good we are, how many gray hairs we have on our head, how many wrinkles around our eyes, how many college degrees, etc., we will all make mistakes. But it's the real performers that will say it's not the, the fault of the branch or the fault of that unexpected gust of wind. It's something that I need to improve in my approach. One of my favorite sayings that just summed up or sums up what you just said is uh, Carl Brashear, the guy who was uh, made famous by Cuba Gooding in the movie uh, um, um, Men of Honor. I was going honorable men. Men of Honor. Thank you. Brett just brought that to me. Is that his saying was uh, his personal saying was it's not a sin to get knocked down. It's a sin not to get back up. That's exactly it right there yeah i like that too yep. um you know let's let's talk about customer service i mean that's what you're coming to town and i'm certainly not here to to take any um uh, wind out of your sails regarding what you're going to be presenting this week but i know let's go ahead and go towards that direction and i also want to specifically talk i'm looking at the time here i want to very much get to your starbucks story because sure. that one it's not just culture meaning borders it's culture meaning all around us yeah you want to talk about some of that stuff well, certainly. I mean, at the 18th Annual Gulf Coast Symposium for HR Issues, I'll be talking about a lot of different uh, different areas, but certainly the the Starbucks story is an example. If that's where you want me to go right now, is that do, okay? do you want to, or you want to save that for your presentation here? I'll, I'll save that for a little bit. I mean, there's just so many different things that we can do to improve our service, and as you and I know, and as you were talking about with your previous guest, I mean, the economy is not exactly robust right now, so it seems like people would be out there doing as much as possible with their existing or future customers, and quite frankly, what I'm seeing these days, and I'm sure you are, is that some people actually seem rather cavalier and lackadaisical about maintaining or getting new customers. I agree with that. I agree with that. And, you know, it's interesting. I moved to Houston uh, 14 years ago, August. And when I came here, it was, it was, a, it was bustling. It was good. And uh, I had a friend of mine who has lived here for many, many years. And he was showing me around. And we went to a couple of restaurants. And I was just blown away by the level of service. And I remember him telling me, well, Rick, these people had to learn during this last bust how to get good, how to treat their customer well, so they would come back. And those that learned survived. Right. This time, I'm not seeing that right. as much. I mean, I can still expect to see Surly in places. And, okay, I'll tell you what. Let me go from there. How do you guys, how did you do it at Disney? Well, How do you think, take young people and guide them and direct them and keep them on 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 mission, on target, on focus? Exactly. Well, what what I'll talk about at the Gulf Coast Symposium is that certainly Disney does not have a corner on the market for doing great things. In right. fact, I will share examples of where we stubbed our toe dramatically and fell flat on our face and how we learned from that. So a lot of organizations get the message, Rick. But the point is, is that you have to know what you're selling. And we knew that we weren't selling rides and cotton candy and parades. We were selling an experience. Other places will sell memories. They'll sell something that's not not able to be duplicated by a competitor because any competitor can duplicate a product, but they can't necessarily duplicate your service. And we had a, a secret mantra that I'll share with your, with your listeners right now. The secret mantra was, Snow White can never have a bad day. 
Wow. And that really yeah. boiled down to, you know, the rides are up and running, and all of our employees, whom we called cast members, had a smile on their face. And that was a, a huge differentiating factor for us relative to our nearest competitor. And, you know, I was my wife and I were, were at Disneyland here um, in Los Angeles, not too – it was last year. And uh, we were out there at a conference, and she wanted to go to Disneyland. She loves the place. And we went out there, and I'm reading your book, and I'm remembering specifically cases where – I remember one young woman – took the time to walk us over to a place we couldn't find. Yeah. And I was like, and you know, one of the things you said, too, you don't point with your finger. You wait, you point with your hand. Yeah. You offer, you, and she did all of that. And I'm telling you, it was, it made an impression enough that I can still remember her and talk about it right now. Exactly. And we realized that most of our cast members, most of our employees, whether they were an hourly cleaning the park or they were an executive walking across the park to or from a meeting, were going to get questions to and from that meeting or to and from their break. And the kinds of questions you were going to get are going to make you pull your hair out unless you think about it from the perspective of the customer. And how do you empower that customer to find the bathroom that's only five feet away? Right. And you could say, well, it's right over there, you idiot. Can't you smell it? Versus you could guide them there with an open hand as you just experienced. Right. Doug, we're going to take a break. Uh, you're listening to Rick Gillis Employment Radio on 975theticket.com. This is Houston's ESPN. This show is brought to you by CumulusJobs.com. We'll be right back. We're talking to Doug Lip of G. Douglas Lip & Associates. He is one of the keynote speakers at the HR Houston Symposium coming up this Wednesday and Thursday. If you're not there, you better walk up and pay your way in because there's still a little bit of space. They'll let you in. It's a real big room. Come on in. Go ahead. Take it out, Brett. Gillis Employment Radio on Houston's ESPN Radio 97.5 The Ticket. Here's Rick Gillis. Uh, I'd like to welcome back, welcome you back to Employment Radio on 975 The Ticket, ESPN Houston. We are talking with Doug Lip of G. Douglas Lip & Associates. He is going to be one of the keynote speakers at the 18th Annual Gulf Coast Symposium on Human Resource Issues. That is this coming Wednesday and Thursday. HR in the driver's seat is the theme. I have the privilege of emceeing this event. And even more so, I'm going to have a privilege of introducing and meeting Doug Lip in person. And I can tell you, it's a hoot to hear you have you on the line, uh, Doug, because your energy comes right through the line. And I appreciate that because some of my guests don't. <laughs> I should have said that. Listen, let's get back to your to the book, um, Even Monkeys Fall from Trees. And the reason I wanted to come back here is because I'm going to go back to the Disney thing. And I would also like to translate this or move it over towards who are HR's customers, how do they deal with them. But you guys had a four set rules. I guess there's rules to create the happiest place on earth. Number one is safety. Number two is courtesy. Number three is show. And number four is capacity. Do you want to talk about those different well, certainly Elements. The, the key here, Rick, is to make something simple and memorable as opposed to paragraph after paragraph of mind-numbing stuff that you see in a lot of books policy or in those. HR policies. Exactly. Right, right. And the whole idea was safety is number one for our employees and our customers. Once you take care of safety, because quite frankly, theme parks are inherently dangerous. They're factories. Sure. Safety is taken care of. Then you go to courtesy. Are you smiling? So as you mentioned, when someone asks you where the bathroom is, you guide them there instead of barking. Safety, courtesy. <laughs> Show means how does the place look? The physical plant, your your costume, we called our costumes, uh, we'd, in, in, instead of uniforms, we called them costumes. So safety, courtesy, are you smiling, are you friendly, show, is, is the place looking good? And then finally is capacity, and that's how many bodies through the turnstiles, and that's how many employees you have. And we felt strongly that if you took care of safety, courtesy, and show, capacity would take care of itself in the form of loyal customers, loyal employees, lower turnover, higher return rates for uh, annual customers. Do you find, um, and I'm sure you would have known at the, at the time that you were involved, that Disney paid equal or more than comparable positions at the other uh, theme uh, parks, et cetera, around Los Angeles or sure. in Tokyo? Do, you, do they pay a little bit more? As an employee, as an hourly, it was fine. But as a manager, we had a little mantra. We said, Disney is a great place to work as long as your parents can afford to send you there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, did you know, I need to go back to a little history here. Did you know Roy and Walt Disney? I'm under the impression you did. 
No, I, Roy passed away. He was he was there before I was. Walt passed away in '66, so I'm sure okay. I saw him when I was in elementary school. Roy right. Disney Jr., <laughs> Walt's nephew, was someone who was on the board, and we we in, were in contact with a lot. Okay, so it was the nephew. Yeah. Okay. All right. I was because I was going to go. You don't look this old, buddy. No, You're... sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now let's go back and talk about cultural and common sense. Sure. Cultural to common sense. Let's talk about that because you know I we. And and I would uh, I would take I'd blame uh, blame guilt for this as well. Um, when I think cultural, I think borders, languages, color of skin, etc. Right. That's not what it is. It's a combination of a lot of things. Right. It could be age. It could be gender. It could be border. It could be language. It's 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 a different way of thinking. That group versus my group. It could be high school students versus junior high students versus college students. They're all different cultures. Right. And you know what? I'm not going to go to the Starbucks thing, but it also because uh, that Starbucks story is rich, rich, rich. I love the story, but it's also disabilities. Right. Or abilities, I guess. Exactly. So how do we how do we cross these borders? How do we get to the other side? I mean, even if I'm just shaking somebody's hand. You gotta trust somebody from that culture who's telling you, you know what, if you wanna do business with, or if you wanna hire, or if you wanna motivate this group of people, you need to approach them in a, possibly a different way. And if you don't trust those, what I like to call culture coaches, then you're not going to get anywhere. If you think it's just business as usual, and I'm using my common sense as opposed to listening to some people who are well informed about that target culture as my cultural coaches, and if I'm not willing to sw- change my style just a little bit, I'll be in trouble. As an example, at Disneyland in Japan, our very first international theme park, we had to take a leap of faith and decide we were going to offer alcoholic beverages in our Japanese restaurant in on, on Main Street. Really? Reason, Japanese customers were saying, if you don't have sake in a Japanese restaurant, it's not authentic, and you want an authentic experience. Even though having alcohol in our theme parks in Florida and California was absolutely verboten, it was against our corporate culture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so you did. We did, and it was a gut wrenching decision. It was and was this a matter of this was a matter of accepting who was advising you on the floor, on the ground? Yep. Okay, and you went there. there. And are you willing and wanting to do business in that culture? And if so, these are the things you have to do. And in some cases, you might choose no. That's too far of a stretch for me, individually or organizationally. Now you live in uh, Southern California, am I correct? I live in Northern California. Was oh, it Northern? Because I, I didn't. Rec- I, oh, okay. I didn't recognize the town name on your business card. That's why I was asking. I'm glad I did. Because um, California is very homogenous. Absolutely. And and it was built on homogeneity. Yeah. Um, and Houston is very similar. Do you find other places where things are a little too narrow, a little too that could uh, use a lot of this? advice or are you finding the internet to be a great equalizer or is or is this because you're working is this where you're going to talk to people yeah I, you know it's interesting i don't think any area of our country is immune from from the globe is shrinking i like to call it backyard globalization so whether you're coming into contact with someone who's immigrating from a foreign country or you're dealing with people who are younger or older than you if you don't have the mindset of flexibility your days are numbered as far as i'm concerned so it's a mindset. It's an openness. It's uh, not that's the way we always used to do it. Um, and I find this quite often when I speak to mature job seekers that uh, it's a, you know, we used to do it this way. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Even like when I'm talking with the HR folks uh, next week is as as a died in the old trainer myself, sometimes trainers think, well, this is the only way that you can educate or train a person. It's got to be in a classroom with a PowerPoint with this and this and this. And it doesn't have to be. It can be exceedingly flexible. It can be on the online. It can be on the job site. It can be one to one mentoring. So it's it could be something as simple as how you train or manage someone. I'll tell you what. Let's talk about that real quick. I neglected to go there when we first started. I brought you on. Tell me about your training. What do you do? Well, I do a lot of I do a lot of one-on-one coaching with executives around the world and I do a lot of contact with people who will say, you know, we need to know what our customers think of us. Would you please go out and and chat with them? So I'll do some secret shopping. I will go out and talk with executives. But more often than not, Rick, I'm working with executive teams who will say, we want to have a better culture in our whole team. And and how do we get there? Because we've trained people, we've thrown a lot of money at them, but we just can't get them to buy into it. And oftentimes I will see the organizational culture isn't supporting that. They'll say one thing, they'll have posters up that say one thing, but the executives or the middle management will do the other. Other, or, they're, or they're not giving people consistent messages. Day one is this, day two is that. Oh, my gosh, this too shall pass. So everybody just sits back and folds their arms. And, you know, you and I talked about this thing, too, and the other day when we spoke uh, that when I walk into a building for the first time, when I walk into any store, I can 
de- I can determine very quickly based on how the reception is or the receptionist or yep. how the greeting is. I know that came from the top all the way down, and I don't care how big an organization is. I think that's been one of the big problems that Home Depot has had for the last several years, yep. that they went to a all money and no customer, and they lost it. Now they're trying to get back. There was a great article in Business Week this week, in fact, about Home Depot trying to get back to the customer. That's the customer focus first. Yeah, and the most important customer is the is the employee as far as I'm right. concerned. If you don't treat your employees well, then they won't treat your customers outside of the organization well, and your days are absolutely going to be limited. So I think that the mindset of treating your, your employees well, and, and a lot of that boils down down to information sharing. Uh, I right. work so Communication. much with, with executives on this. Right. Doug, I've got to let you go, but I'll tell you what, I'm very much looking forward to meeting you this coming week. And uh, like I said, I'll be introducing you. And anybody who didn't hear you today, we'll start off with a little quacking. Well, if I could encourage people to look at my website, they can see some different ideas Good. about what I'm going to talk about at the EHR convention. It's DougLip.com, and hopefully they'll see some stuff about online training there that they uh, think is interesting. Good deal. DougLip.com. And by the way, that's L-I-P-P. That's D-O-U-G-L-I-P-P.com. Doug, Doug, thank you so much for being on the show today. I look forward to meeting you this week, buddy. Thank you very much, Rick. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. All right. Listen, you've been ta- we've been talking with Doug Lip of G. Douglas Lip & Associates. Like I said, he is going to be one of the keynote speakers this week at the HR Houston, HR in the driver's seat. It's the Gulf Coast Symposium. It's one of the biggest events of its kind in the nation. And I'm very pleased to tell you that I'm going to be emceeing this thing. So, woohoo, yay. Um, I needed to take a little bit of time right now as I'm closing out the show to uh, – this is my last show for ESPN 97.5. And um, I wanted to hit, so I want to talk about that real quick before I go out. I want to remind you, every Tuesday evening, coach, career coach Terry Atkinson and I host the Art of the Job Search Teleseminar Series. That is at 7 p.m. There is no cost. You can listen on.